nuclear collisions. Which may seem really weird, right? How can those two things be connected? They're really big, really small. Well, that's kind of the point. So now back to the real small, right? So here we are. We have the atom. We zoom inside. We see the nucleus. We see the protons and neutrons and the quarks. Um, so there's something funny about the strong interaction, right? Um, in some ways, it's not so different from electricity and magnetism, right? Um, the basic features of the theory are the same with electricity and magnetism, except for one small detail, right? So just to kind of help maybe explain the detail, some of you may know that like when we see light, right, that's, you know, we can think of as electromagnetic waves, but there's a quantum component that we think of as photons, right? And in uh, kind of our most advanced theoretical understanding of electricity and magnetism, we think of the electromagnetic interaction as being mediated by the exchange of photons, right? Well, the strong interaction works the same way, okay? Except instead of photons, we call them gluons, right? These physicists are very clever, glue, right? The gluons, they hold the quarks together, right? So gluons are like photons, except for one important thing, which is that gluons, unlike the photons, carry charge, right? So it's as if you took the electromagnetic interaction where the photons, you know, um, let's say, produced by an antenna, right? As they leave the antenna, they actually feel the effect of the antenna because they interact with it, right? Well, that's what happens with the strong interaction. Plus, the strong interaction is stronger, right? So in fact, one of the consequences is is that the, while the fundamental theory actually starts not being terribly different, the strong interaction has very different consequences in the real world. So first, what I want to talk about is the four fundamental interactions, right? You know about gravity, there's electricity and magnetism, which we see in our everyday interaction. You certainly see light, right? Um, there's the weak interaction, which um, you know um, the guys who work here at, at uh, the LAC interact with all the time. You don't see the weak interaction very much. Okay, and then there's a strong interaction. Now, the strong interaction, when I was a young kid, we thought of as binding protons and neutrons into nuclei, right? But in fact, these days, we think of the strong interaction as a thing that governs the interactions between quarks and that the mediator of the strong interaction is the gluon. So, gravity plays a critical role in cosmology, but my re research is focused on the strong interaction. So here we are, back again to the structure of the atom. And those quarks, right, they have, because of the nature of the strong interaction, they have this problem that they can't be actually observed as free particles. They're, the term we use, confined inside the protons and neutrons, which is very inconvenient because we particle physicists like to be able to look at particles and play with them and study them and so forth. And when they're confined, um, that makes it harder, right? Uh, never mind the fact that, um, well, it makes it harder. Okay, um, just, I'm going to get a little technical here, but, but just to give you some uh, sense of what's going on. Um, unlike electric gravity, which at least in its classical form is a lot like uh, uh, electrical interactions, right, and electrical interactions, right, where the force between the two charges or two masses falls off like one over distance squared, right? Many of you learned this in physics or you've heard it somewhere or another, right, that the gravity is not quite true when you include general relativity, but gravitational force between two objects f decreases with distance, and the same with electrical interactions. Well, it doesn't work that way with gravity. To give you some picture, and this is a picture that we actually use in physics, right, as a as part of our theory and the tools, right, is you can think of it that the interaction between two masses is governed by a field, right? And for gravitational interactions and electrical interactions, the field kind of extends out in all directions directions, right, from a particle has mass or charge, right, and because it extends out in all directions, right, you can think of like fields, you know, emanating from something, and this kind of an, a net conservation of the total amount of field such that if I go further and further away, the strength of the field has to get smaller and smaller, and in fact, in three dimensions, it should go like one over an area of a sphere, so it goes like one over r squared, right? Well, the strong interaction, because the gluons carry charge doesn't do that anymore. In fact, the, the field kind of interacts with itself and it collapses down into a little tube that gets stretched between a pair of quarks. And if you pull them further apart, right, 
it doesn't the, the strength of the force doesn't decrease. It actually stays the same. And if you pull them further apart, it stays the same. And you pull them further apart, it stays the same. It's almost like a spring, except the spring, the force gets stronger. It's like a spring that's kind of weird. You keep pulling it, and the force just remains the same. But the problem is, you keep pulling, and you have to put more and more energy as you pull these things apart. And it would take an infinite amount of energy to actually separate two quarks by a macroscopic distance. Okay. Now, in fact, long before you'd ever get there, what actually happens is that you put so much energy into the field that you create other particles, right? Um, and effectively, those particles combine to produce systems with confined quarks. So, as I said, this is rather inconvenient. Now, in fact, you could ask the question, how do we know they actually exist? Right? Well, one way we know they exist is that we actually see events like this 